Hi, my name's Dino Chiesa, and I'm with Apogee, and I'm here with my friend Robert Brockelman Hello. with Level Consulting, and we're here to talk about modernizing your SOA, and how are we going to do that, Robert? With APIs. We're going to do it with APIs, that's right. Just a little bit of introduction for uh, the two of us. Uh, I've been with Apogee for about three and a half years, and I'm a solutions architect. I work in the technical field with customers that are using Apogee, and uh, I help them understand how to use Apogee with their existing systems. And Robert is a longtime practitioner in the area of uh, integration technologies, and I'll let him introduce himself. Uh, hi, as uh, Dino said, I am Robert Brockelman. I'm a principal consultant at uh, Level. I've um, been working with various middleware technologies for about 15 years now. Uh, last two years I've been working with Apogee Edge. And looking forward to presenting here today. Great. So just uh, before we get into the content, um, I want to mention that the slides that we are presenting today will be available on SlideShare um, as well as uh, YouTube. We'll put the presentation on YouTube as well for replay later. And if you'd like to continue the conversation about this topic, we have the Apogee community and we can support that kind of uh, conversation uh, for as long as it lasts. So visit the community and you can ask questions and get answers about this topic and many others. And with that, uh, I'd like to yield the floor to Robert, who's going to tell us a little bit about uh, modernizing SOA uh, with APIs in a particular uh, scenario that he's worked closely in. All right. Thank you, Dino. Getting on the right slide. Okay. This is modernizing service-oriented architecture with APIs. I am from Level LLC. A little bit about me, it's a fast-growing uh, IT consulting firm that combines the innovative DNA of a startup with the wisdom, scalability, and process rigor of a Fortune 100 company. Uh, they focus on a number of different areas uh, for advisory services, including uh, DevOps, cloud, mobile, user interface design, big data analytics, and uh, payment strategies. Um, I've been, been working with Data Power, which is going to be one of the things we uh, talk about here a little bit today since uh, 2010, and again, I started working with Apogee Edge since uh, 2014. Uh, before we get started, some disclaimers, warnings, and health hazards. We tried to add a little bit of humor to this, but uh, the lawyers say we got to do it. What we present here is uh, one of the numerous possible ways of using Apogee technology. Uh, your situation and requirements will probably differ, and if they don't, you're probably doing something wrong. Um, as always, test things in a non-production environment before uh, deploying them to production. It's a very important one. Uh, it's amazing how many times people skip that. Um, and we're not responsible for the spontaneous combustion of the known universe or any other undesirable outcomes from the things that we talk about here today. Be careful out there. Uh, this presentation describes a large organization's journey from an existing SOA and integration platform to uh, API management. Unfortunately, that organization will remain nameless. So Robert, just uh, just a comment with all these uh, disclaimers. It sounds like, just my perspective, it seems like you've been there before and you want to make sure people understand. I have done several presentations like this, both at trade conferences yeah. and, and these webcasts, and I'm just call, covering all my bases and various companies I've worked for. They made me put something in there some form right. or the other. I always like to make the uh, lawyers uh, jump a little bit by talking about spontaneous combustion and, and other similar things. All right, so let's get started. Uh, so our agenda here, very quickly, uh, we're gonna talk about the business and technology drivers for adopting APIs and API management. We're gonna talk about the current infrastructure and so on integration capabilities of this organization, the gaps in those capabilities, uh, the considerations and the requirements that this organization came up with uh, for their API management platform, and then we're gonna talk about uh, the in-state architecture and the lessons learned. Jumping right in, what are the drivers? These come into two, uh, two high-level categories, the business side and the technology side, which is uh, common with the adoption of a, a lot of new industry trends and uh, technologies. On the business side, we had mobile, B2B integration, SaaS solution integration. We want to be able to facilitate wider adoption and also increase business opportunities. Um, one note I always like to call out, uh, some people would say, why, why is the SaaS solution integration under the business side? Uh, it very much over the last few years, it was the uh, business that was driving the uh, adoption of uh, software as a service uh, rather than having IT do something in their uh, uh, traditional uh, data center. Um, after they had a couple dozen of those uh, SaaS solutions deployed out there, they found they needed to start sharing data. Um, so having uh, uh, an intermediary like an API gateway sitting between all those SaaS solutions to help with uh, spreading the data out across all those different platforms uh, was something that was very important and being driven by the uh, 
business side. Mm -hmm. On the technology side, um, APIs are the direction that the industry is going. Uh, APIs are generally easier to develop with than their predecessor standards. Uh, think SOAP or EJBs, although on a personal note, having uh, been around the industry for a, a couple of decades at this point, if you think SOAP was hard to use, you might want to try a CORBA or DCOM from before that. Oh, yeah. Good stuff, good stuff. Had to, had to put out uh, the, the legacy uh, mention there, right? And then also um, maturing standards in this space around APIs, especially for security, authentication and authorization. You have OAuth, OpenID Connect, and JOT. I think you'll actually be filming something on uh, JAW tokens a little bit later. Looking forward to that, Dino. Uh, in the realm of interface definitions, there's Swagger 2.0. That's a key component of uh, Swagger and uh, Apogee Edge uh, is, is built on top of that. And then also JSON schema. So what were the existing SOA and integration capabilities that this organization had? What was our starting point? On the SOA side, the, these capabilities read like any number of white papers. Uh, we've been, this organization has been doing this for a while, as has the industry. Uh, SOA governance and service lifecycle management. These are key components, of course. Um, service metadata re registry and repository uh, handles all the details of versioning of services, routing information, security policy, uh, having a standardized enterprise security model, um, enterprise service standards that uh, everybody follows and some basic expectations are always laid out ahead of time, standard error handling, reporting, statistics logging, and there's other details. And again, there's a lot of white papers and this has been done many times for, for quite a number of years now. So nothing nothing off the, the beaten path on that side. So you would say that this is just a kind of a typical large enterprise. Absolutely. Been in business for a long time, a lot of different business systems, as you said, migrating towards uh, including more SaaS systems into the enterprise. Uh, and they had in place a lot of SOA practices and, yes, and usage. Uh, a lot of IBM uh, technology as well. You mentioned uh, WebSphere MQ, um, XML uh, in use, data power in use. Oh, so yes. probably kind of typical for other large organizations that have been around for a long in time. In my experience, uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we, we get to the IBM integration stack and where that fits in the story in the uh, next slide. On the integration capabilities side, um, this is tends to be a little more specific to each individual company, but uh, as Dino just mentioned, there's just dozens of on-premise uh, commercial off-the-shelf or COTS uh, applications and third-party systems. And we have to be able to get all those to talk to each other and share data, and again, just integrate them. Uh, most of the traffic that uh, it passes through this um, integration system is SOAP over HTTPS and XML over WebSphere MQ. Um, in general, it's, a, it's an ESB, an enterprise service bus. We talk a little bit more about that SOA pattern in a moment. Yeah. But the key things that this does is data transformation, protocol transformation, and security integration. In the 10 years I've been working with ESBs, that pretty much boils down to what, what those things do. And again, yeah. presenting this is very typical of what a large organization would be doing at this point. Yeah. So no big surprises there. Great. Uh, continuing on, uh, this organization, their starting point was the IBM integration stack. Again, uh, WebSphere Message Broker, now called IIB, WebSphere MQ, uh, Data Power, uh, Wizard, WebSphere Services Registry and Repository, and WTX. And uh, note where this presentation does focus on what uh, WebSphere Data Power was being used for and, and for a couple of different patterns. And the relevant patterns, I mentioned the, these already, but Enterprise Service Bus and the Service Gateway. Yep. So just basically right out of the IBM Red Books. Uh, yeah, I would characterize Nothing it that really way. Nothing really exotic yes. here either in uh, the usage. Anybody out there in the audience who's you know in an IBM shop or familiar with IBM Red Books, uh, stuff that we're describing here should look very familiar. Yeah, great. Okay, digging into the patterns, enterprise service bus. Uh, you can see the big box in the center. That's a standard IBM federated ESB pattern using all the products that we mentioned on the uh, on the last page. On the left hand side, you've got a bunch of different SOAP service consumers. These could be COTS applications, they could be .NET applications, they could be Java JWE applications running in JBoss or WAS, could be uh, older systems that are using, you know, some third-party legacy uh, SOAP API, uh, or excuse me, library. On the right-hand side, we have various SOAP service providers. Again, JAXWS, .NET, COTS applications, and then a lot of MQ messaging, asynchronous request respond, uh, producing messages and consuming messages. 
and throw all that together and you've got uh, tens of millions of requests uh, passing through the CSB every uh, every day. So big, big business. It runs the business. Yes. This Mission is... critical. Yeah. Has, has to be up, highly redundant. Um, again, all very standard yep. patterns in the IBM world. And the role of data power in all this is to act as a security gateway in front of the ESB, largely in front of a WebSphere message broker uh, yep. flows. Mm -hmm. Next pattern, a little more involved, obviously a more complicated uh, picture. Uh, this one on the top, there's a, the ingress and the egress. On um, the top side, the egress, this is where service consumers inside the corporate network uh, need to be able to invoke services uh, that are actually hosted outside the network. Uh, these may be SaaS solutions, they may be third-party hosted systems that the uh, the organization actually controls. They may be business partners, uh, but the key thing is you've got uh, something on the inside that has to pass through um, a security layer in the DMZ, the service gateway, and hitting various endpoints, service providers on the outside. Another key part of this pattern is that ESB that I had on the, on the previous screen. Uh, the service consumers talk to the ESB, and then the ESB forwards traffic out into the DMZ, and then from there on out into the internet. Um, converse of all this, reverse, uh, the ingress model, where service consumers out on the uh, internet, again, SaaS solutions, B2B integration partners, are making calls into our DMZ with uh, data power acting as a uh, as a security gateway, yeah. um, media, applying various uh, forms of mediation, hitting service providers that are hosted inside the organization's uh, data center. Again, the mostly SOAP services, um, come in COPS applications, uh, .NET, JWE, uh, all manner of evil, if you will. So this is the prior state. This is the state of uh, how things were prior to introducing API management, uh, including the Apogee Edge product. This Correct. is what the company was doing, and the company had been delivering this and maturing this over a number of years. Yes. Yeah, and you were involved in that. Yes, that I was. Yep. Okay. So uh, one of the reasons why I got involved in the API management side with this organization was I knew very well where we were coming yeah. from, all the edge cases, the skeletons in the closet, if you will, so I was well positioned to take that information and be able to uh, successfully deploy an API management yeah. solution um, alongside it. We've described what the current infrastructure looks like and what we did with it. Uh, what are the gaps in, uh, in this infrastructure that was uh, driving uh, the decision to start moving towards an API management solution? Um, first up, uh, what I like to call legacy baggage. Uh, this was primarily created by the organization. It's not a function of the technology. I don't think it would have mattered what technology was there building an integration stack. Any company that's uh, got a mature ESB or mature integration uh, stack deployment is going to have a, a lot of edge cases and a lot of uh, skeletons, as I mentioned before. Uh, this creates complications and, and obstacles that must be dealt with, but they can be dealt with as long as you capture them ahead of time and come up with a, a solid plan and well, stick follow through with it, if you will. Um, the existing integration stack products uh, were not built with REST APIs and a JSON data, uh, data structures uh, in mind. It was added largely as an afterthought that's created some complications as if we've attempted to do a couple of different APIs and uh, REST services. And then what we have out there today is missing a developer portal. Uh, by a developer portal, I mean a one-stop self-service shop uh, for developers throughout the development lifecycle that ties into the DevOps plans for the organization. Um, basically, if everything a developer needs to get to write code, get a user ID and a group provision in LDAP, uh, get test cases created, if they're waiting on somebody to manually set all these things up, they're not being very productive. So. Likewise, being able to find documentation. Uh, we, we had nothing like that. It was all done through email and, and opening tickets and waiting for things to happen manually. So the goal here, moving to REST, moving to JSON, moving to a developer portal that enables consuming developers to use the services that have been published, the goal, if you sum that up, is probably just to let the organization move a little quicker. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So continuing on, uh, something I want to call out uh, for these gaps, the information that I'm describing here is current as of the uh, fourth quarter 2014. All the products here on the IBM side and the Apogee side and just about any other vendor are undergoing uh, current a active development. So things change. Um, I know a couple of the things that I mentioned here uh, have actually been addressed in, the, uh, in some of Apogee's competitors. 
So, you know, these things happen. So, Robert, you, you mentioned 2014. Here we are. It's when, as we speak, it's January 2016. Yes, it is. Is that correct? 2014? It is. And that's just when you made the evaluation, when you were going through your evaluation period. Uh, right? Correct. Uh, Great. Late Q3, early Q4, 2014 is when the RFP, RFC process was going on. Um, the purchase of uh, the Apogee Edge product actually happened in. Uh, early Q2 2015, yeah. and we've been working on a rollout to production uh, since then. Yeah, great. Uh, so anyway, uh, continuing on with our list, just want to make sure we're all clear on what the time frame was on these, because uh, we want to present uh, factual information. Um, our existing infrastructure one is able to perform JSON schema validation and API request response validation based upon a Swagger 2.0 uh, data definition or interface definition. Uh, you'll see later that uh, the use of Swagger as the interface definition was uh, very important to this organization. Uh, it had limited support for APIs in Swagger.20 uh, in the existing service registry. Um, there was no support for a standards-based API security model, again, the OAuth 2.0, OpenID Connect, and uh, JWT tokens. Um, and the current infrastructure was all on premise, so uh, we were limited to a single part of the country. There was no geolocation based routing. Um, basically, the next phase of our, our next phase and evolution of our integration platform, we wanted it to be out in the cloud and not tied to a data center that uh, this organization maintained. So, to be honest, I see that kind of thing all the time when I talk to customers. They want to move more and more towards cloud to get. Uh, to reduce the costs and get a little more agile and flexible with how they deploy systems. And then they want to move to APIs in order to get developers more agile in building against those systems. I would agree. Um, I think as I've gone along and worked with different customers, I've found that um, although the traditional role of the system administrator and the hardware admins managing a data center, it sucks up a lot of time and money and resources that an IT department could deploy elsewhere to, to be productive, add value to the business. Sure. Uh, I mean, you know, it's a basic story around cloud yeah. computing, right? But that's yeah. only a, that's only a, one component of this API management strategy right. that we're that we're trying to describe here today. Yeah. So we've talked about uh, where we started. We talked about the gaps. So now that it comes to the question of why do we want to modernize? Why do we want to use APIs? And in trying to answer this question, I went out and grabbed a, a couple of different sources of information. Some of it's from the uh, Apogee uh, API marketing literature. Some of it's from a few other places. My experience has been that uh, one of these ring, one or more of these tends to ring true with just about everybody, regardless of who the audience is. But very quickly, it's just APIs have become the industry standard for system interfaces of all kinds. Um, they hide complexity, expose existing functionality. Um, one that I really liked is we started moving things from our internal, uh, our own data centers into, or the organization's own data centers out into the cloud, is APIs can serve as the basis for reporting those systems and functionality into the cloud. Um, it makes it easier for other business units and business partners to access systems and data, but also uh, maintain security, again, the standardized security model we uh, mentioned before. And then I view this API management and APIs as the next step in the evolution of uh, SO integration and platform. I like the way you said that. Um, there are some of the customers that I talk to that look at APIs as a, as a way to kind of revolutionize the way they're thinking about business and information processing. They want to turn their, their business into a platform. They want to invite lots and lots of different developers to consume programmable APIs, and this is a, a new thing for them to expose these programmable interfaces. Mm -hmm. But the way this organization looked at it was a little bit different, as an evolution, not a revolution. Not as a, something that would totally disrupt everything, but something that would uh, progress from where you were today to just get more agile, better ease of use with developers, and just yeah. better agility in it, the business. You know, it's, it may not be the most exciting story in the API management yep. uh, space of the industry, but the simple fact of the matter is it's a large organization, mature, thousands of business partners, a great deal of time and money spent integrating with those business partners. Yep. And it simply comes down to uh, the search for a better, faster, cheaper way of integrating with business partners yeah. and, and third parties and, and also interfacing with uh, customers. That's a big topic, lots of uh, details, but at the end of the day, what we're doing with APIs and API management is simply streamlining what we've been doing for years uh, with this particular yeah. client and their customers. Um, with SOAP Web Services, WS Security, SAML, WS Trust, and emailing WSDL files back and forth, essentially. Yeah, yeah. That's where that developer portal comes yeah, in. We're really nice. Trying to uh, just, just streamline that. 
Yeah, so um, just to just to interrupt, uh, we haven't gotten to the uh, to the benefits yet, and we have a long way to go. But would you say that uh, the developer portal is the most important part of an API strategy? I would say the developer portal, which is the outside world, all those third party developers view into your organization, is a com key component, combined with. Uh, your strategy or an organization's strategy around API governance and API lifecycle management. So those three buzzwords, developer portal, API uh, lifecycle uh, management, and uh, API governance, together yeah. I would say is the core of what API management really is. So you can't really pull one thing out and say, well yeah, that's, that's the important thing. I don't really need these other pieces. Uh, you can't really separate them. Important. Pull them up. <laughs> exactly. They, they work together. And that's the experience that I've gotten from other uh, customers as well is it's the it's the uh, synergy behind or w among all those different pieces that really makes sense. Have to use that buzzword. I had to. Okay, yeah. we did at least one, so yeah. it's good. We, we got that taken care of. All right. So this comes down to now: what were the requirements for an API management solution and an API management strategy that this organization came up with? And it's very important to remember that this is what one organization did. As I said when we started this, the requirements for your organization are going to be different. And if you decide that they're not, I would have to say that you need to reevaluate that. You're probably doing something wrong. First up, we want to use an API first design methodology for APIs. And uh, this goes right along with how Apigee Edge Server and its development tools work. Moreover, they want to use Swagger 2.0 as the interface definition language. Uh, kind of a, a whistle for APIs, if you will. I'm sure somebody will be criticizing me later for describing it that way, but yep. at the end of the day, that is what it is. Um, Swagger 2.0 ties together as a security model, our standard data and messaging models, uh, our API internal API standards, and the internal SDLC process. It also provides a very simple and easy to use text testing mechanism uh, for APIs, all right there in one thing. Wisdoms never did that, haha. -ha. But uh, anyway, and then the developer portal. Came back to that one again. Um, it's just that one-stop self-service shop for developers, uh, access to developer registration, application registration, API documentation, subscribing to APIs, security registration, creating users, groups, provisioning these things. Um, you no longer have to have somebody uh, wait to do that manually for you, which is the way it's still done in many large organizations today. And most importantly, it's all self-service. If you can achieve that, you're probably going to cut out a large chunk of what developers spend their time on, has yep. been my experience. Now, just to be clear, the developer portal experience that you're trying to provide to the, uh, the consuming developers, it's, uh, cust that's also customized for the organization's requirements. Yes. Which means you take, you, you, the plan is take the Apigee uh, Edge developer portal and customize it to accommodate those additional requirements. Yes, it is. That you have. Yeah. And that is, that is a separate uh, webcast is what that is. Yep. But, uh, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of interesting plans around that. Yep. Uh, we'll see in the in-state architecture diagram, this uh, organization tied together several different SaaS solutions and cloud-based um, systems to build their uh, API right. gateway platform, Azure Active Directory would be a uh, would be a perfect example of that. Uh, the Apigee Developer Portal had to be customized to be able to uh, provision uh, application definitions, client identifiers, client secrets, and similar things uh, inside of Azure Active Directory. Yep. And again, lots of details there. Would love to get into it, but we are a limited amount of time. Um, so continuing on with the uh, requirements. As a starting point, this organization took their existing SOA governance and service lifecycle management paradigm and applied it to APIs. Uh, we have found that it, it was a starting point. It started to evolve from there, but at the end of the day, it was the same environments and the same QA and load uh, testing processes that everything was moving through. So uh, to continue to leverage the investment that had been made in SOA governance, uh, there was a, re we'll, we'll call it rebranding that was done and it was simply used as a starting point for API lifecycle management and API governance. So far, it's worked okay. Um, most uh, Another very important piece, we need to continue to realize the return on investment of the IBM integration stack. Uh, it would have been a, a use for his political suicide to, to walk into senior management and say, okay, we're throwing away uh, everything that we've done internally and we need to re-implement it on something else. That, that Again, it's an evolution of the existing integration stack. And, and aside from being political suicide, uh, really from a financial sense, this is an investment in an asset that the organization has developed Absolutely. with your help. 
Uh, and it's not something to lightly sort of sweep aside and say, well, we don't, we don't need this work. All the reasons that you had built that still exist, and it's still in place, and it's still delivering value. The, the world did not change overnight just because the concept of API management was introduced. Right. That's got a neat new uh, wrapper layer around it, um, but the same basic requirements and business problems that you need to solve yep. still exist. Uh, that is one thing I always feel like is missing from the marketing literature of API management. I'm glad I had the opportunity to get that out there. Thank you, Dino. <laughs> uh, Quite welcome. All right, so moving on. Um, Supported use cases, single page, responsive web applications, B2B integration, and internal system-to-system -system communication. And I also seem to be missing that SaaS integration, all important SaaS integration, which I think uh, going forward we're going to do a lot more of that than we are the internal uh, integration of COT solutions. But there'll be a mix of all these things yep. for a while. And then this organization has a bunch of Java developers and a bunch of JavaScript developers. And whatever we did in the API management space, the, the tooling that we chose, we needed to lever, leverage that so we didn't have to go to management and say, uh, you know, a mm -hmm. bunch of new positions needed to be created or people needed to be retooled. Yep. Um, being able to utilize existing skill sets was very important. Hey, let me ask you something now that you brought that up. Um, Java and JavaScript, you, you mentioned APIs as a, as a way that's that maybe brings a little additional agility to people that consume the interfaces. Um, do you, does the organization look at a trend towards uh, JavaScript as opposed to Java built on WebSphere? Do they look at that as an opportunity to gain additional mm -hmm. agility on the API publisher side? That is an ongoing discussion. I would say that uh, the development community within this organization would very much like to move in that direction. Mm -hmm. But the infrastructure side, there is a massive investment in both uh, both financially and in terms of process definition on sure. the WAS, JWE side. Um, everything from X509 cert renewals to having log files gathered up so they can be analyzed by InfoSec in one place to uh, monitoring and on-call rotations for resources uh -huh. in the WAS. Um, all those things need to be addressed before you can do you know, wholesale migration over to a to a JavaScript and a Node.js uh, backend development paradigm. Um, somebody else would say, well, you can start small and grow from there. And I agree, and th we are starting small with that, but that is right. exactly what we're attempting to do. So it's somewhat complementary and independent in some ways. You can move to JavaScript if you want, but it's not necessary. And it's in by and large, it's, you're not coupling them. This organization is not saying, well, if we go to APIs, we're also going to move to this uh, new uh, platform for the back end as well. Yeah. If I had to venture a guess, I would say three to five years out, all new development would be JavaScript. You'll start to see that yeah. switch. Yeah, but it'll be gradual. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. So it's going to depend on which developers were assigned to your project, and you know what do they know yeah. very well? What are they comfortable with? Yeah. Uh, moving on, on the security side, uh, again, ESB, SOAP Web Services is an enterprise security model based around SAML 2.0, WS uh, Trust 1.3, and WS Security. Uh, that was used as a starting point uh, for what uh, the enterprise API security model was supposed to look like. Um, and we also wanted to be standards based, so we started with OAuth 2.0, OpenID Connect, and JOT and applied some of the ancillary standards around OAuth 2.0 and we were able to do something very similar that we'd been doing with SAML and, and WS Security. Mm -hmm. Again, the standards-based approach to security is something that I recommend to all my uh, customers. Sometimes the industry doesn't necessarily make it simple, but that yeah. if you do the work up front to achieve that, it's always possible to swap components out in the future if uh, companies go into mm -hmm. business, they get bought, things get merged, the product goes in directions you don't like, This is these are good things yep. uh, to keep in mind and be prepared for, architect around, if you will. Um, PCI compliance, not a requirement now, but it could be in the future. Apogee Edge Public Cloud is built on top of AWS, which does have PCI compliance options, so uh, we haven't spent much time researching that, but it has been done before. And Apogee could speak to that at another time if for sure. anyone who's interested. And then we wanted a cloud-based solution. I talked a little bit about this before. We want to extend the on-premise integration stack capabilities into the cloud. Uh, going forward, there's going to be many more SaaS API providers and consumers, and there are um, on-premise deployments of cloud applications. Even as we were talking about a moment ago, homegrown stuff, uh, enterprise uh, APIs, even SOAP web services that are created 
probably going to start to see a migration towards so cloud the hosted. Cloud. It'll yep. be in the cloud. It'll be written in JavaScript, Node.js. Um, it's going to be really cool. To solve yep. all the problems. Yeah. Well, sarcasm. Add people a little, don't add think a little that, cloud. Yeah, in. yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. Just sprinkling um, sarcasm. People, please remember that. Uh, anyway. We don't want to be limited to a single cloud provider and then all the other usual benefits of a cloud-based infrastructure. That's not our focus here today, but there's yeah. any amount of literature out there and, and companies um, toting what, what exactly that means. We'll leave it at that. I maintain it's a good thing. So this brings us to what is API management. And this is kind of mom and apple pie, perhaps, for the, the audience that, looks, that uh, has come to view this webinar, maybe? Probably. Um, I would hope most of the people who are watching this have some idea of what API management's about or what they want to achieve with it, but mm -hmm. we put this in there in case uh, yep. in case they don't know. Just a level set, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what is API management? Just like, just like I did with the previous slide, I went out and grabbed a couple of definitions that would uh, hopefully mean something to somebody if uh, not all of it. The process of publishing, promoting, and overseeing APIs in a secure, scalable environment. I'm pretty sure that one comes strictly from the API or the Apigee on marketing literature. Thank you, Dino. Yes. <laughs> then um, ensuring that developers and partners are productive. Uh, it manages, secures, and mediates their API traffic. It allows an organization to grow their API program to meet increasing demands. And another point that I like to call out, because I think there's a lot of confusion around this for somebody who's new to this space and trying to, or is part of an RFC, RFP process, and trying to figure out what's going on. Every API management solution that I have seen on the on the market has three basic components, a management portal, a developer portal, and a runtime gateway. Uh, everything that you're going to do with these, uh, every piece of functionality fits into those three components in some way. Yeah. Um, I found that when I'm talking with a new client, starting with those three circles on the board and kind of expanding out from there is a really good way to get yeah. the conversation started. And you and I were talking a little bit earlier. This definition, while it may be kind of review for the people that are attending this webinar, you found that using this definition inside the organization and communicating out to the different stakeholders, the people that would care, the executives, yes. you found that using a kind of simple definition like this, vendor neutral, kind of just technology definition, what is this thing, helped a lot in communicating yes, what we're doing here, what, what's really happening inside your organization. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for reminding me of that. <laughs> Lots of things that we wanted to get out there that we did not write down. Okay, so. We, we addressed what the requirements are, then there was a project to implement all this stuff, and I got the last two slides out of order. We're supposed to show the in-state architecture and then do lessons learned, but instead we're going to do lessons learned first and then review the in-state architecture. I can't wait to see it. All right, yeah, me too. So let's hurry up and get through the lessons learned and then we'll get to the in-state architecture. Okay, so first one, um, obviously given the uh, politics and the investment and uh, mission critical business systems that were running on the existing uh, integration stack, especially data power. We left that in the data center for, for this organization and let it do what it had been doing for a, a number of years. And our API gateway, our Apigee Edge, we decided to put out in the cloud. And this allowed us to continue to realize the, the ROI with IBM, the return on investment with the IBM integration stack and let it do what it's good at. And then we were able to address our gaps and do the things that uh, in the API management space that we wanted to, independent of our mm -hmm. of the organization's data centers out in the cloud with Apigee Edge Public Cloud. Um, next, when you are deploying a piece of uh, complex middleware, really anything out in the cloud, avoid creating runtime dependencies for something that ties back to your data center, uh, especially if it, your data center, there's only one of them. You know, if you've got two data centers and one's a primary and one's inactive, well, if your, the internet connection on your primary data center goes down, uh, you just created a, an outage to your whole cloud platform, thus negating the most of the benefits of it running in the cloud. Right. Um, architecting the IA, the identity provider stack, the IAM stack, the uh, the logging, the uh, and all the other runtime components of our API gateway and everything that we wanted to do with it, um, making sure that those were all cloud-based and not de having some dependency in the background that tied back to a, a data center that the, the company owned uh, was a little challenging in the beginning. And we didn't get it all exactly right the first time. It's absolutely amazing what ends up going back to your data center, even though you didn't, you, you didn't realize it the first time around. Um, next, and this is probably one of the most important ones and the ones I got asked most often, is going forward for the foreseeable future, there's going to continue to be a mix of SOAP and REST APIs. Um, all those COPS applications that we have in the, in the data center, uh, 
they're going to continue to be sold for a long time. We're not going to upgrade them just because they have a new version that has APIs. There's going to be business drivers for these things. So uh, another very important message to communicate to the entire development community and to management was the SOAP services don't go away overnight. That just comes back to that integration stack and that ESP. They're not going anywhere. Uh, it's an evolution. In this case, it was not a revolution, as fun as that may be. Yep. Um, and then APIs, uh, there are specs developing in this space. It, it is a maturing segment of the industry, but they are still, the specs themselves and the implementations in various products, proprietary, open source, whatever, um, they're young, especially compared to the WSPLAT specs, some of which have been around for upwards of 15 years now. So things are changing in this space. Um, be prepared to be flexible going forward. For example, JSON schema, which you are using, yes. is still sort of evolving, still in draft phase, I think. Yes, it is. I think draft version four is what we're, uh, the libraries that we're using for it. Um, it some details will change. Yep. There's some parts of the spec that are a little fuzzy and not everything's 100% uh, interoperable. But you yeah. evaluated and found it good enough to yes. use now. Yes, we so did. Despite the fact that it may change, uh, you're willing to tolerate the, the risk of, um, mm -hmm. of change and you figure it's mostly pretty stable uh, there there is an assumption there obviously uh, I actually when I was looking at JSON schema libraries for yep. node.js and Java I looked at like six of them measured the performance um, some of them only did draft uh, version three some of them four yeah um, so lo a lot of decisions in there um, there were some gambles there some assumptions I will come back in a couple of years and tell you how it worked out yeah Okay, so those are lessons learned, but may I ask another question? Uh, the first one you said uh, you, you wanted to follow the evolution, not revolution path. So you're continuing to use data power as that gateway for external services, ingress and egress. For anything that was in place, it stays in place. Correct. Is that right? Yes. So you haven't actually migrated load to Apigee Edge. It's new, it's net new workload. Is that uh, right? That is correct. The one thing we did do is the API gateway in the cloud, all of the future activities around mobile and B2B integration, uh, one, we're going to have them start using APIs um, that we either develop in house or have uh, build wrappers around mm -hmm. COS or SaaS solutions. The primary point, entry point for those is going to be the cloud-hosted API gateway, uh, rather go, than going to our uh, external service Got gateway it. in the DMZ. Um, so th there is that. So all that stuff that's sitting back in this organization's data center, um, from the perspective of the API gateway, it is just another API provider. Yep. Um, Got it. Almost sounds like I'm belittling it in some way, but you know, when all things, all things being equal, just a couple a of years from now. We're going to have hundreds of APIs advertised on this thing. We'll probably have some silk services passing through Apigee at some point, too. Huh, interesting. Okay. Hey, I'm dying to see the picture. Okay, yes, yeah, so let's move on. We're, we're almost there, almost done. So our in-state architecture. Um, in the upper right-hand corner, we see the uh, company data center. This just covers the uh, internal ESB and the so uh, our SOAP actors that communicate with it. And then the external service gateway, doing that ingress-egress thing is a primary entry and exit point from for services and API traffic. Yep. Um, then out in the cloud, uh, we have all the interesting stuff with Apigee Edge in the center as the um, API gateway. Uh, it uses uh, Splunk in the cloud for logging. Uh, the version of Splunk in the cloud that we we're using actually didn't have a syslog interface. I, my understanding is they've addressed that. We actually had to create a couple of VMs yep. that we could write syslog messages to that then had um, Splunk heavy forwarders installed on them to forward mm -hmm. that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, I don't know the status of that, but my understanding is they were working on uh, fixing that. Then uh, for authorization policy, we actually use a Zacmal product, and uh, that's a separate topic, but uh, all authorization policy for each API um, is managed by a, a Zacamal PDP. And, and that's on-premises, that's in the on-premises data center, is that correct? Uh, the, this would be an example of one of the things I didn't quite get right in the first design of this. I did uh -huh. not have anything deployed in the cloud that could address um, our, our Zacamal PDP requirements. Uh, uh, an example of a company operating in this space would be uh, Axiomatics. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also, a, in the IBM security stack, there's a TSPM, Totally Security Policy Manager. There's a new name for that. Unfortunately, I do not recall what it is. It'll come to me about three seconds after we stop filming. Um, but one of my goals for 2016 is to get this organization off that uh, thing that's deployed in the data center for security policy management and get it onto something that's deployed in the cloud. Um, for the identity provider, uh, basically the OAuth authorization server, uh, we're using Azure Active Directory. This is one of the more interesting parts. Uh, we could, at some point in the future, do a case study of integrating uh, Apigee Edge uh, with uh, Azure Active Directory for uh, API and OAuth security. Yeah. 
And then uh, finally, uh, Apogee Bass, uh, its data store capabilities. I think they're Cassandra databases. Mm -hmm. I actually use those quite, uh, quite liberally uh, for storing various pieces of information that tie back to runtime, which uh, talk with your local uh, Apogee expert about whether or not that's a good idea. There were some varying opinions, but that is the way yeah. I decided to do it because I really liked the uh, tools that were available out of the box with uh, user grid and uh, Apogee Bass for managing all that data really versus helpful. the uh, key value uh, maps that are available internally. And then, of course, on the left-hand side of this, we have a bunch of different actors acting as API consumers, business partners, mobile apps, um, mm -hmm. single-page responsive web applications. You name it. If it can call an API, it'll be running through its traffic. Will be running through our API gateway. And then on the right-hand right. side, various API providers. So, uh, on the um, in the link between the cloud-based uh, Apogee Edge API gateway and the existing data center, it's going through the um, ESB gateway. Uh, yeah, anything where an API is hosted on-premise in this company's data center, uh, it's going to pass through the external service gateway, yep. then through the ESB, and then onto that API provider, because then internal actors um, operating in the data center yep. uh, already, they're going to go straight to the, that interface for that API on the ESB. Right, that yep. interface already exists. And the, the question I wanted to ask is, have you changed those interfaces in order to accommodate um, access from the cloud? Are they different? Did you have to modify them in order to allow Apogee Edge to call into them? We did modify the, we did not change the implementation, but we did modify a wrapper API that had the new security model yeah. and address schema validation. We had a, several existing APIs that had Swagger documents Mm -hmm. um, but we weren't using those Swagger documents to enforce, uh, you know, these query parameters and headers needed to be present. Uh, this was the JSON schema. We weren't enforcing it, any mm -hmm. of those details. Uh, now we've created uh, libraries both on Data Power and on uh, Apogee that, that do those things, and we found that not everything in the Swagger documents was entirely correct, and so we've had to um, modify a, those. Maybe another example of a spec or um, a specification that is evolving. Uh, it is. It's also an example where the organization started using them, but they weren't they weren't testing them I see. all the details of that to its full uh, full capacity. So there were some yep. things that slipped through that we didn't realize yep. were wrong until we actually tried to enforce it at runtime. So it's sort of an ongoing process of refining that and and getting that connection just right. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Good. And then with that, I believe we are at the end. Uh, Q and A. Yeah, so that's the end of the prepared remarks. We do have some questions that have come okay, up. Fantastic. Um, and I'll, I'll throw you one that's kind of open-ended. Um, would you say that the API management solution that you've deployed provides a seamless integration with the ESB that you already had in place? Hmm. We're getting better at that with each generation of, each, uh, of APIs. Uh, the first one that we did was messy. Uh, there are also concepts mm -hmm. of implementing an enterprise wrapper API around a third party to insulate the organization from changes to that third party API. Uh, that way you can do all the data uh, manipulation in one place rather than having every individual consumer inside the organization having to be driven to do changes by uh, external mm -hmm. factors. Um, we're pretty good at that on the SOAP side. We're getting better at it with uh, JSON and APIs and Swagger on the uh, API side. Mm -hmm. So um, that takes care of that one. I have another question though. Um, we had one person say, would it be accurate, would you agree with the statement that Apogee Edge is doing minimal um, transformation, for example, JSON to XML, um, or vice versa, minimal security management, minimal transaction routing? Um, from a security standpoint, uh, we have an enterprise security model that uh, dictates that a JWT token has to be, uh, a JWT token issued from a Zero Active Directory has to be attached to the HTTP authorization header of every API request. And if you get through the JWT uh, token validation step for that authentication phase, mm -hmm. there's then an authorization phase where it evaluates the uh, Zacamole authorization policy. Uh, even a even an API that's public, that uh, has no real authorization policy attached to it, it still has an authorization policy that says anybody can call this. And so uh, those two steps right there, we actually spent a few months building all that and making sure that it was uh, very bulletproof. That also came back to the uh, Zero Active Directory integration. Um, so 
to say that it was minimal on the security side, that, that is not true at all. We're actually yeah. pretty intense with security on our cloud-based API gateway. You've really turned the crank on the existing uh, model, the existing security model that you had in place with uh, XML and SOAP services. Yes. Uh, you've turned the crank, added in the cloud-based uh, IDP, the yes. Identity Provider in Azure AD, um, using a different token model, but applying similar principles that you've already applied in the, uh, the existing SOA, yeah. right? The, neat, the one neat thing was we had an example running, functioning on our ESP with SOAP services, that, and we were very happy with the security model that we had there. It was very flexible. It allowed us to make exceptions and implement exceptions yeah. when needed. Uh, you can imagine how we have the front side of our API gateway. There's a standardized security model. Everything looks the same. It requires a JAW token with certain uh, claims being defined in it. Then on the back side, sometimes a JAW token can be passed on. Sometimes it's mutual auth SSL. Sometimes there's a, a basic uh, basic auth with a static user ID and password that was issued to us by a third party. Yep. Um, sometimes it's just a subscription key. Um, our security model and what we're doing with security in Apogee Edge is, again, flexible enough that we can deal with all those different um, scenarios and do it primarily through configuration changes. So we're not doing a lot of development to make each one of those things uh, right. happen. There's this thing I called the token swapper that we implemented in yep. Apogee, which was mo modeled on something we did in data power back in our ESB. Where, just, where the communication comes in bearing a certain token or a certain set of credentials, and it's uh, it switches to another set of credentials. That's kind of a standard security practice Absolutely. that we see in a lot of enterprises. So that's what you're doing in Apogee Edge yes. today. That's one of the things and you're doing. Doing that securely can be get a little tricky and also messy, but I, I think we're pulling it off nicely. Now, the other side with protocol transformation and data transformation, protocol transformation is a minimum. It's pretty much HTTPS in, HTTPS out. Um, yeah. About the most complex thing we're gonna do from a data transformation standpoint is uh, we may put do a JSON wrapper around a SOAP service that was on the back end. We have a couple of those. Um, we implement that through a combination of out-of-the-box uh, Apogee policies and then some JavaScript and some XSLT, depending on what makes sense. Yeah, yeah, so a little bit of that. Uh, and But you, would you expect that uh, kind of work to continue? Uh, you'll probably see broader use of those kinds of things as time goes on? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. There's always going to be some lightweight transformation that needs to be done in almost every case. Another interesting thing that we're doing is uh, we're using JavaScript and the, okay, the JavaScript that we're writing for Apigee, we're also using when Data Power's uh, gateway uh, uh, engine, which is their JavaScript, uh, server-side JavaScript engine. So we're actually writing cross-platform JavaScript that can run in both places. Mm -hmm. have to run it through the browserify command to, uh, to really get that to work yeah, well. Yeah. Uh, again, separate topic, we could be here for a while talking about that, but yeah. um, we're trying to, if there's transformations we have to do where we advertise the interface both internally in the ESP and in the API gateway, uh, if we write a lot of JavaScript code to address that. Even some, some of the XSLT, uh, we try to make it so that we can run it on both platforms. Yeah. So, um, how would you rate the experience so far? So you went through phase one, really. The organization went through phase one of deploying API management using, uh, relying on Apogee Edge. Uh, what's the experience been so far? Um, overall, I'd say good. Um, a lot of politics, a lot of new concepts. Mm -hmm. Trying to rein in the enthusiasm for API management, new technology, uh, and combine that with the discipline from our SOA governance practice and change management yep. policies. Uh, there, there are challenges around it, um, getting everyone under control and uh, getting everyone marching. So you're saying in the same there's direction. a lot of excitement to, to pursue this, but yet uh, that excitement can can court, sort of lead people to be uh, to neglect maybe the basic foundational stuff, like yes. let's make sure the security is done right, let's make sure our audits are done properly, let's make sure our SDLC conforms to the pre the standards that we require. Yes, that my, kind of thing. my role was primarily for uh, developing. You're the adult testing, in the room. Something like that, yes. <laughs> but um, the secure the AP, the enterprise API security model, the governance, the uh, API lifecycle management, making sure all those pieces were tied together, yeah. documented, and they actually worked, and people understood what needed to be done. Um, ongoing yeah. process, but those are the boring parts that are really hard. But that's also key foundational pieces that are needed for a successful API management program. For an enterprise, for sure. You, you can't neglect For that. the enterprise, Otherwise, yes. and we, you and I talked about this uh, repeatedly uh, as time went on, but if you don't cover those things, then you've sort of doomed 
APIs to be a niche thing that's not going to get broad adoption, it's not going to be used uh, throughout the enterprise. If you don't cover those foundations, it's, it's just not going to be acceptable to the rest of the enterprise. The way I would describe this, and there's probably going to be somebody out there somewhere who's going to be booing me for this, but in the same way that it was really easy to screw up SOA and SOAP web services without SOA governance mm -hmm. and SOAP lifecycle management, yep. it's really easy to screw up APIs and API management without the governance and, and API lifecycle management. Yeah, so, so you still need uh, intelligent people with a good perspective on what the problems are. You need to address the security. You need to kind of shepherd this through, mm -hmm. educate the organization, and do things thoughtfully. I like the adult in the room concept, but yes. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. Okay, so, um, so I think that's all the time that we have for questions from the field. For the additional questions, we'll, we'll try to get to those uh, on yeah. the community website. If you do have follow-up questions uh, or if you have any comments, we'd love to hear those as well on the community website. So I'll direct you uh, there. Uh, the attendees that are, that are listening live would be great, as well as anybody that's been viewing this um, on the replay. Uh, community website will, will continue to be there carrying that conversation. So please do patronize that. And one more reminder, the slides uh, will be available on SlideShare and YouTube uh, for those of you that want to get those uh, at a later date to view them again. Uh, it'll be a couple of weeks, but you should see that uh, as well. So thanks, everyone, for your time. Thanks for coming and attending. Uh, again, it's Dino Chiesa, Robert Brockelman. Um, glad that we were able to spend some time with you. Thank you, everybody. I hope you got something out of this.